readings this morning, and I, I let Ray, our, our liturgist, off the hook. Uh, I'm going to read both of them. I'm going to read one, and then I'll come back to the second one uh, a little bit later. But uh, the first reading is going to come out of the book of Genesis. It is Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 25. It's on page 2 in your pew Bible. And if you also have your Bible app, you can use that uh, as well, if you like. Then Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as a partner. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man had made, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Most of you, uh, most of you know me. I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a pastor. Most of you see me on Sundays, and that is primarily the role that I have encountered you with. I've seen you obviously on Sunday mornings and Bible studies and uh, you know funerals and, and celebrations here at the church. Most of you have probably not experienced a whole lot of my other world. I have a whole other thing uh, that I do. I, I do weddings. I've been doing weddings uh, for the better part of almost, I would say almost 30 years. Uh, I've done over 1,600. I counted them up this summer. And for the longest time, I was saying 1,500. Then I realized that the clock keeps ticking and you just keep adding them on. And so I've done over 1,600 ceremonies. And it started in a very weird way. And it was, there were a few things that God did to me or through me in that process that uh, really sort of formed the way I, I think and really formed how I got to the point where I wanted to put all of that into a book. Uh, when I started my ministry, I was a chaplain at a private school in Atlanta. And uh, it was at a, sort of an Episcopalian uh, background school. They had chaplains, and, and there, there was uh, me and a good friend of mine, Steve. We were we were the chaplains on staff. And something interesting happened. I had someone who was a teacher came and they asked me to perform their wedding. And I was still in seminary. I was finishing seminary, and 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 I I didn't know really what to do with it. I had a very typical outlook of well, you get married in a church. You should go to your church, and you should get married by the minister or the priest there, and that's how it's done. And I said, well, you know, so I wrestled with that for a little bit, and I agreed uh, to do that wedding. And I, I, I guess my struggle was I wanted to make sure that they were attending, that they were doing something uh, afterwards. And so we had some conversations about that. And then another weird thing happened. I was performing this wedding, and uh, it, it, another couple came up to me after that wedding. They introduced themselves, and they said, will you do our wedding? Okay, and and then this thing kept happening, and and then these uh, these uh, wedding coordinators or uh, banquet halls or venues or barns wherever I was going, they started asking me for a card, and I didn't I didn't have a card. I had to go through this whole like, well, I guess I will come up with a name. Uh, years ago, I came up with the name wedding chaplain. I took obviously wedding and the fact that I was a chaplain. I, I thought long and hard about that. Merged those two together. You no, know? uh, <clears throat> but. Then it, it really just did start this process, and it is one of the it's one of the things that I I enjoy. I love going to weddings. It creates sometimes it creates a burden because it's it's Saturdays. Uh, you know, I miss a lot of college football games. Um, there was actually a we had a wedding here last November, and when it was booked, I didn't think anything about it. They said we wanted to have it at the Saturday after uh, Thanksgiving. And I'm like, yeah, and I just didn't process it all in my head. They said, we're going to start the wedding at 3.30 on the Saturday after November. And then I 
Once it got too late, they already turned in their paperwork and everything. I said, wait a minute. The game is going on. And it's Michigan-Ohio State game that starts at noon. And so I'm, I'm out here with this family trying to, like, we're, you know, it's your special day. We love you. And I'm just looking at my watch the whole time. And, and we're literally up here on stage, and my watch tells me the, the, when something happens, okay? And it was the fourth quarter. So the music starts, fourth quarter, and I'm up here, and I'm trying to just look at them both in the eye and, you know, God loves you and happy future, and my watch is just going nuts. So uh, if you were a Michigan fan that, that went a certain way, and if you were a Ohio State fan that went a certain way, but it was very exciting. Um, but it, it is something that sort of became a passion for me, that, that just to reach into the lives of people on this, not just a particular day, but in this part of their journey, was extremely special. And I started like, why? Why is this such? Why was this such a big deal? Uh, one of the things that I started to notice was the the population that was finding me, the population that would seek me out. Uh, many of them did what what everybody is sort of doing nowadays. Is they, they found me on the internet. They, they uh, I, 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 I'm on uh, certain little wedding websites. People can find me that way. But over time, over years. I started to see this pattern. And the pattern was that these folks don't go to church. They don't go to church. And, and there were a number of different categories. That was sort of the wide swath. Some of them uh, went when they were young. And uh, they stopped going when they went to college. Okay? Some of us, we have those in our own families where, where hey, uh, I grew up in the youth group, uh, graduated, went to college. Somebody said something to me in my first year English class, and I stopped going. All right, or it just it just sort of fell out of it. Or they met somebody at college. They met somebody, and then you know, uh, I like you, you like me. Well, I'm Protestant. Well, I'm Catholic. Well, we'll figure that out. And then they realize that's a little more difficult than uh, than you would normally think. And so they go, well, I don't go to yours. I don't go to yours. And so what do we do? Then I started to sort of see this other thing where the people wanted to get married other places. They wanted to get married outside of the church. There's actually an interesting statistic. 70% of church, 70, 70% of weddings are now out of the church building. Okay? You think back to that song back in the 50s. The song was going to the chapel. What are you going to do in the chapel? You're going to get married, okay? They have not come out with the going to the barn uh, to get married. And so, and it's so funny because that's where everybody goes to get married, and all the farmers in the room are like, what is this? Like, how is this working? Okay? Um, but these folks, they, they, did not have, they did not have a faith. But what else started to sort of arise is I would hear, some, I would hear some, some horrible stories. I would hear some stories of people who, again, they grew up, they left that faith, or, or they, they sort of put it on the side. The, the, the tagline that I would hear over and over and over again was, we're spiritual, we're just not religious. We're spiritual, we're just not religious. And there was something about... The, there's something about the organized religion that people did not like, okay? And I always told people, I was like, well, organized religion is way better than disorganized religion. And that never got the laugh that I always wanted it to. But, like, in, but what was interesting, and I would always ask them, why do you want to minister? Why do you want to minister? Okay, all right, so you've had a bad church experience. You, you don't go anymore. Stop going. Uh, whatever. But here you are. You're 24, you're 25, 26, you're here in my office. Why? Why do you want me to do your wedding? And we're like, we want somebody real. I was like, I, okay. I don't, it was always the Pinocchio question. It's like, I'm a, I'm a real minister. Um, and it, some of it is, well, we, we, want, we don't want an, an internet ordained person. There is a whole flock of those out there. Some of you, Ray, you actually had to do a wedding, so, you know. Uh, but, there was a whole bunch of people that they just show up for the event. They just show up for the wedding. Then there's a there's a there's a, the, the sense that even if I had a bad church experience, they were okay with the minister, and I I really couldn't process it. I really couldn't sort of get it through uh, my head that you know I kind of thought we were sort of part and parcel. If you had some some negative stories against the church. There was also a minister thing in there. And they said, no, we're okay. We're okay with the idea of the minister. We're also sort of of the mind, well, this should make it official. 
And I always tell people, I'm not going to, I'm not sprinkling, you know, pixie dust on you or, or anything along those lines. Uh, you know, it's not magic. I'm not going to magically fix you or, or, you know, make you last for 50 years or anything like that. But there was a sense, we want, we want a minister. And it was in that season I realized this is the group that I need to be evangelizing to. This is the group that I need to be showing up for. The other thing that I realized, too, is if I don't, and if other ministers don't, uh, something, will, something else will happen. Is that if they stop coming when they were 18, they come back, they find me when they're 25, or find whoever... The chances are, if you don't have some kind of meaningful interaction with them, they're going to disappear again. And the next time they'll show up, they'll show up for a funeral or an event or someone else's wedding or, or whatnot. And I realize I have a very small window that I have to engage and have a conversation with these folks. But the other thing that started happening, too, is it, it, was, it was weddings that really taught me how to have a relationship with God. It is really weddings that taught me how to, to really understand what God's purpose is for all of us. And I have had, I have had, I've had, you know, some of you have had bad weeks. I've had bad weeks. It never fails. When I have a bad week, I always tend to show up at a, at a wedding on a Saturday, and God says something. He shows me something. He reminds me of something that I may have forgotten. God, where are you? What are you doing? Have you not seen what's going on? And then I'll show up and I will see this moment. And it is a reminder of the kingdom. It is a reminder of all the things that are good. And so we get into this text this morning, this, this, this story out of Genesis. And one of the main things that, that we should know is this. that The Bible begins and it ends with a wedding. It begins and ends with a wedding. In Genesis chapter 2, you have this wedding story. At the end of the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 19 ends with, we call it the, it's the marriage supper of the Lamb, or, or just to be, be frank, it's the reception, is the marriage reception. There is a ceremony that takes place in heaven. And the idea, we have all kinds of, we have all kinds of stories or ways that God uh, talks about our relationship. He's the shepherd, we're the sheep. Uh, but over and over and over again, especially in the pages of the Old Testament, uh, there is this interesting idea of the, of the husband and the wife, the, 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 the God and the spouse, and that there's, a, there's this interesting relationship that is there. And that when we walk away from God, uh, the comparison is that, that wayward spouse. But coming back to Genesis, uh, the, the reality for th this story is that it starts off with this very interesting idea. It says it's not good that man should be alone. Now, it's not necessarily saying that it is not good for a male to be alone. But it's the idea that it's not good that a human being should be alone. Okay? Now, any of you who have been around men, you, you do really know that. It is not good to leave guys alone. We, it's just, that's just bad policy uh, all around. But it starts off with this idea that this, there is this loneliness piece that is present in this text. And Adam's sort of walking around. He's naming all these animals. Okay? Uh, and then he realizes, he does the math in his head. There's two, there's two, two, two. Wait a minute. Two, 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 one. And then it says that, uh, that the Lord is going to create a helper. Okay? Now, the helper, uh, it, it, uh, people have stumbled over this passage for years, for, for centuries. Uh, the word helper, uh, at least the way we sort of put it, it sort of, it sort of paints this, okay, here's the guy, and then you've got this, this helper, this servant, this secondary uh, person that is underneath, and, and there are all kinds of, of bad things that have happened in church history when you frame it that way. But when you get into the word, the word is actually incredible. It's the, the Hebrew word is ezer konegdo. And it is possibly one of the most difficult words to translate in the Hebrew language. Uh, the word helper, it, it, it starts off with this, you know, and I, I, I get a helper. I mean, I, I love Misty. She helps me with everything. Uh, I heard a comedian recently sort of says that when you get married, you get a little helper when you drive. 
Uh, you didn't realize you need it. You get a little helper. and uh, they, They're there to remind you when the light turns red and when the light turns green. They're there to help you to make sure that you're not too close and not too fast. And so it's a great thing to have this helper uh, in the car. But that's not really what Genesis is trying to describe. What the word is really trying to do, it is, it is, the word, it almost means like a mirror image. That you have one person looking this way, one person looking this way. And they are not the same, but they are mirror images of each other. Or the idea, it's, or, or it's like if you have two puzzle pieces, okay, you have two puzzle pieces, if they are the same shape, they will not go together. You actually need this puzzle piece to be shaped this way, this puzzle piece needs to be shaped differently, but they go together. The other one that, that, that I, I just fell in love with and have spent a lot of time thinking about is that there is actually, there's a military connotation to the word. That it is actually, if you were to translate, the old, uh, the old King James translates the word as help me, which is sort of a, 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 just a, a clunky way of, of translating it. But the word helper means they are the reinforcements. They are the reinforcements. They are the ones who are coming. When you are in trouble and all of a sudden you sort of look over the hill and here you see the flag coming up and you hear the horns and all of a sudden the cavalry is coming down the hill to your rescue. That is what Genesis is trying to describe. That help is too weak of a word and we sort of can't really get around it in in a, a better translation, but it is the idea that we are working together. There's actually sort of this idea of of I've got my sword and she has her sword and we're sort of back to back fighting off whoever is attacking. Now, if you think back, if you think back to some of the old, some of my favorite movies, there was a whole, in the 80s and the 90s, there was this whole uh, trope of movies called the buddy cop movies, okay? Uh, There were two cops, they didn't like each other, they got put in the same car, you know, Beverly Hills Cop, there was like a... There's a bunch of them. They're just all over the place. And, and the whole idea and the reason we love those movies is, well, look at those two. How are they working together? Uh, they don't even like each other, but they know they have to. And by the end of the movie, of course, they have each other's back and all that. But that's really the reality, that a good marriage is an 80s buddy cop movie. Don't quote me on that. That's probably not as good as I thought it was. But the reality is that's what this is about. The marriage is an institution that is designed by God. And when, what's real about this is it's not just that it's designed by God, but that God is in a, in a certain way is trying to explain to us in a better way how our relationship to God should be. That your marriage, a marriage, is a, is a picture of our relationship to God. And that re, our relationship to God is actually a picture of marriage. And it's that that sort of started to turn the lights on for me. That is not good for any of us. It is not good for any of us to be alone. And it's not to say, don't go running out and get married if you're single. Okay, Paul actually uh, talks about that. Hey, if you're, if you're single, it's okay. Uh, you can actually do some more things for the kingdom. But it's not to say when, when, when Genesis says it's not good for a man to be alone, it's not good for you to be alone. And that I'm actually, God is actually trying to come and find you. God is actually trying to come and build more bridges with you. God is trying to get closer to you. As we uh, continue, one of the things that's amazing in this passage is the first poem is right here. Okay, That when, when, when Adam sees this person, you can't really see it in, in the text necessarily. When you break it out in Hebrew, it's a poem. It's a love song. Okay? Adam sings the very first love song when he sees Eve. He says, at last, okay? Now, there's an old Etta James version of at last. I don't think he sounded that good, okay? But just sort of think about that. When, when Adam sees at last, and it's like, how long is he really waiting? He's only been there for a couple of days. He's named all the animals. He's all bored now. He says, at last, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was it's a huge moment. It is a huge moment for Adam when he sort of recognizes there's something here that has completed me. 
So if this is God's plan, if this is God's plan for us to uh, work together, if it's also God's plan for this to be a model of our relationship to God, then you would have to expect a few things. You would have to expect that this thing would be under attack. And it is. And the longer I spent time uh, in the wedding industry, the more I realized this, this is in trouble. This is in trouble. Okay, um, And I would have to spend a lot of time. There would be a lot of time where I would, would talk with a couple, and the couple would want to say, well, we just want you to come to the wedding. Can you just come to the wedding? Just, my name's uh, Tom. This is Sally. Just, can you just come to the wedding? Like, I, guys, I don't do that. I, do, I want to have a conversation with you. I want to get to know who you are. I want you to spend some time with you and sort of figure out, hey, where, you know, where are you going? What are you doing? Uh, all of that. And the reality is, it, it, our culture has sort of bought into this idea where it's just the event. And if you have this big expensive event, if you have the more expensive the event is, that's, that's the magic. So if you could spend a whole ton of money on this event, it's going to be your big day, and that's going to take care of it. But the reality is, the marriage rate today is the lowest it has ever been since the U.S. began keeping track of these records back in 1867. We're at the lowest marriage rate we have ever been. 20%, 20% of all marriages are distressed at any one time. 20% of marriages are distressed at any one time. Over 40% of all new marriages eventually end in divorce. 37% of divorcing couples seek counseling, while only 19% of marriage, married couples actually seek help, seek help. It is troubling that so few couples seek help in this process before they get divorced. And so I realize it's way more than me just showing up at an event. There is a conversation that needs to take place. If you're open to the minister talking to you and you actually want to minister there, then I take that opportunity to say, hey, there is a whole different thing here. There's a whole different thing. I know you're really super excited about this Saturday, six, seven months from now. There's a whole bigger story that goes along with that. The other thing that's sort of interesting, though, is that early on I realized that um, that, that one of the problems that I was solving for people was actually perpetuating a problem uh, that was taking place elsewhere. Eventually, eventually, my goal, and one of the things that I wrote the book about, is I would love to put myself out of business. What I mean by that is the reason that people call me to do their weddings is because they are not engaged in other churches. And it would be so much better for me, okay, just to free up my Saturdays, but on a global and eternal level, if every pastor sort of got into this pool to say, hey, this is a great opportunity for us. The very demographic that churches suffer from, the very demographic that we struggle with, okay, where are the 25-year-olds, where are the 30-year-olds, where are the 35-year-olds? I think, well, they're in my office, they're on my phone uh, three or four times a week having conversations with me. But... The reality for each of us is we come out of the pandemic. Okay? There's things that we experience here in this church, but just on a national level, on a national level, pre-pandemic, 34% of people attended church four or more times in a month. 30% attended one to three times a month, and 36% attended less than one month. Now, just two years after the pandemic, okay, so back in 2022, the research came out, and those numbers went through a drastic change. Now only 26% say they attend four times a month, 31% three times, 43% say they attend worship services at their church less than once a month. Now, that was in 2022. And I would love to say, oh, well, it's 2022, it's over now. No, that number continues, that number continues to shrink. That the conclusion coming out of the pandemic that those, uh, it, just the percentage of Christians, not just those who are, are, are just uh, common folk, Christians say they attend church monthly, that number has dropped from 64% to 57%. It's tragic. Now, our second reading comes from John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. This is probably one of my, my most favorite passages. It says, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. 
And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw out, draw some out, and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the, wine, the water that had become wine and did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn it out knew, the servant called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Jesus began his ministry at a wedding. And that is a powerful story. We're, there was always sort of this debate of the, why? Why does Jesus do this? I mean, it's not like he's healing. He's not raising someone from the dead. He's not restoring someone's blindness. He's not, you know, feeding 5,000. He's basically uh, he's just making sure that the wedding has enough wine. Okay, what kind of miracle is that? But the reality is I have seen, I have seen all kinds of moments. If you've ever seen a distressed bride, if somebody can help the distressed bride, there is no better opportunity for you to be able to help another person. Now, I've seen some things. I, when I first started, I, I started I started doing weddings. And I really didn't know a whole lot. Uh, and, and early on, I, I learned some things that I had to carry with me the rest of my life. One of the very first weddings that I was a part of, there was a fight. Okay, I might have told some of you this, but the very one of the very first weddings I was at, uh, they had it set up. They wanted to... They wanted to have the entrance. When you come in, they wanted to have the procession where, the, where the, the guys and the girls were walking in together. So the groomsmen and the bridesmaids were walking in together. Uh, now, the bride, uh, it was her sister who was the maid of honor. Now, what they had said, they wanted the groom, they wanted the groom to stand next to the, 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 man, the best man. And that meant that the bride, the maid of honor, would have to walk in by herself. Now, uh, this took place in South Carolina. Okay? No offense to South Carolina folks, uh, but that's just for context. Um, the sister was offended. And she kind of liked the best man. And she thought this was their moment, that they were going to get together. Okay? Uh, and so she, I don't want to walk by myself. I want to walk with the best man. And we go, well, we're going we're to try to do it this way. And like, no, I want to walk with the best man. And this thing starts to elevate. And I, I kind of figure, well, maybe this happens at all rehearsals. Maybe this is how this should always be. This rehearsal took two hours. Two hours. Okay? Uh, and uh, finally, the, the sister relents, and uh, she's sour. You can see sour grapes. She's just sort of upset this whole thing. Uh, the rehearsal dinner, we go to the rehearsal dinner, and the rehearsal dinner is at this, it's a barbecue restaurant. And, uh, and it was perfect. It had the little... You know, fluorescent pig outside. It had smoky, you know, ambiance inside. They had a steel guitar band playing. It was awesome. Okay, you, you, it was a, it was that. It's the kind of place they had the paper towels on the table in the middle. Like that's how you know you're at a good barbecue place. So we're all having fun, and but we're sort of through the smoke. We could see in the corner. I saw the sister and the bride, and they were doing this thing. And they were doing this thing, and they were doing this thing, and it was like this slow motion where you try to get over, like, you know, try to send people over there. And before anybody could do anything, the sister hits the bride right here. And oh, it was terrible. Everybody's crying, and it was just, it was a mess. It was a mess. And so they kind of made up. Obviously, there were more issues than the rehearsal. Uh, but it was it was still terrible. The girl got married the next day. She had a big shiner on her cheek. It was terrible. It was terrible. No, it, couldn't put enough Mary Kay on it to fix it. It was just bad. Okay? But she got married the next day. And they're still together. And I think that they have a good relationship with the sister. But um, I've seen all kinds of the. I guess one of my other favorite stories was I, I had to learn to ask the right questions. There was a couple. Uh, I, I did a wedding. And I'd only done a few small weddings. Okay, uh, Small little chapel weddings, things like that. I had a couple they asked me to do a wedding, and it was at the Piedmont Driving Club, which is in the heart of Atlanta. The Piedmont Driving Club is probably one of the most 
prestigious clubs in Atlanta. It was the frou-frou of the frou-frou who went to this thing. There were 400 people at this wedding. Okay? It was just massive. And I walked in, and I'm, you know, for all of you who know, I'm shorts and flip-flops, and I walked, there's butlers, tuxedos, you know, silver trays, gloves on their hands, all the women were wearing hats. It looked like the Kentucky Derby. It was just, just that kind of place. Uh, and I was just, I was mesmerized at what I was seeing. It just was not what I was used to. But this couple weeks earlier had said, hey, we're going to write our own vows. Is that okay? And I didn't know, I didn't know the rules yet. Like I didn't like, and I just, but I didn't want it to sound like I didn't know the rules. So I said, yeah, absolutely. You can do whatever you want. Absolutely. And they said, can we keep them a secret? Absolutely. Why wouldn't that work? That'd be fine. So we're out on the, uh, the, 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 there's a little gazebo by the tee box of the first hole and beautiful summer evening. They're out there, the musicians, they have the string quartet playing. I mean, it's just perfect, just perfect. And so it comes time for their vows. And they pull out these, these scrolls. Like, oh my goodness, this is going to be epic. They have like parchment paper. They're unrolling like a, like, a, like a proclamation. They're unrolling this thing. And she reads her vows and they're beautiful. I mean, they're just beautiful. Heartfelt, honoring of the moment, mom, grandma there, everybody. It's just perfect. And she just took a lot of time, a lot of thought to say what she wanted to say in that moment. And then he read his vows. And he unrolls the scroll and he says, you're hot, but you're also cool. And that was it. He rolled it up. And, um, and I, I looked at her and I mean, hot was appropriate because she was beautiful. Her face turned hot. Her face turned fire hot. And, and I could see mom's face hot. I could see grandma's face hot. That was just not a good moment. And I didn't know what to do, so I, I quickly end the service. Wedding party comes over here, and then they go over here. And she said things to him <laughs> that you, never, you would never want anyone to say. And she said them all. On, on wedding day. They're still married. But, but all of that, all of that sort of led, that, that one of the things I always try to tell couples is it's a process. This is a process. That, that the day is not going to fix it. Even if it goes bad. Even if you have things that go bad. Okay? Uh, I have had, I've had people pass out. I've had people, uh, I've had brides pass out, grooms pass out. I've had groomsmen, bridesmaids. I had one, one girl one time, we were outside. We had a little gazebo wedding. And um, there were these little bushes on the outside of the gazebo. And uh, the, the, the dad, it was, I, I, I said, you know, please stand. And the dad's walking the bride down. And uh, they, they get to the bush. And I was about to say, who presents this woman to be married? She lets go of dad's arm. And she goes over to the bush. And she opens the bush and just, <laughs> just throws up into the bush. And just throws up, throws up. And then she closes the bush. And then I'm good. I say, well, you're good. I'm good. And we just kept going. And, and, but the reality is, whether it's a good day, whether it's a bad day, it's not the day. It is the process that we're trying to talk these couples through. That we're trying to sort of explain that, uh, that it is not just an instant, but it is something that happens over time. I spend a lot of time talking about it as a process between... Dating, engagement, and marriage. And every time you go into a new phase, something changes. Something is different. And the other reality is, is that as soon as I start hearing what I call the happy language, okay, the happy language, and uh, it, it's the popular thing now, is that the, the couples that, that talk to me, uh, whether they're wanting to get married, or eventually I'll have some folks who swing back and they'll start telling me, hey, things aren't going well. And they'll start saying, well, they start, well, I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy. And they don't make me happy anymore. Uh, you know, we used to be happy, but now we're not happy. And I was like, you just, that's not how that works. That is not how that works. Okay, just give it some time. Eat some popcorn or something. I mean, it, it, happiness will come back. But they sort of base their lives on that. What the scriptures tell us is that it, marriage is not there to make you happy. It is there to make you holy. It is there to make you better, okay? 
Misty's job is not to make me happy. Okay? She makes me a better version of who I am. And each of you who have spouses, you know that is, that is their primary job, to make you a better version of who you are. She makes me a better driver all the time. Okay? But the reality is that, again, when we say that, that Scripture closes, Scripture closes in Revelation chapter 19 with the idea of the wedding. There's another passage that's incredibly important for us to understand. When we think about the theology of weddings, we think about what exactly is going on, the theology of marriage. And in Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, there's this incredible passage, I won't read all of it, but uh, there is this, there's, a, there's an idea that gets debated all the time. There's a word that sort of makes people bristle and it sort of makes people pull back a little bit. It's the word submission. In verse 21 it says, be subject or submit yourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, that one gets a lot of, of, of reactions. I'm not submitting. You're not submitting. We're, we're this or that. But when you go down to verse 25, this is really the idea of what God is trying to get to, what Paul is trying to get to. Paul says this is a very important thing. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, when Paul says that, just that one idea, first of all, he was saying it to a first century culture who did not have a very high view of marriage, did not have a very high view of equality, did not have a high view of any of it. Just the whole idea, just the whole idea that the husband and the wife would submit to each other, that was not present in the first century. But when Paul says this, he's actually putting a model, he says, I want you to actually love each other the way that Jesus loved you. Wow, wait a minute, hold on. Okay. Well, how did, how did Jesus love us. If you just think about that for a second, what exactly does he want to say? The first is that we should, obviously, we should submit to one another. But the idea, how much love does Christ have for the church? And it's as we gather on this day, as we, as we gather on this World Communion Sunday, as we're about to partake of the elements, this is the one thing that Jesus was trying to say. That the, the Last Supper was by no means, it was by no means fancy. It was certainly not the, 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 the world's best reception. But it was the moment where Jesus is trying to explain this over and over and over again. He says, they will know you, they're going to know you by your love. And if a marriage can sort of catch what Jesus is trying to say, what Paul is trying to say, this model that is put before us, it is going to change the culture. It took on a whole different idea coming after this moment where Jesus says that you need to love one another. Not just out of duty, not just out of sacrifice, but the actual choice to love. And if any of you have been madly in love, you also know that there are days where you have to choose to love. Okay? You have to repeat it over and over again. Okay, I, mean, I, I have no idea how many times Misty says, I love this man, I love this man, I love this man. I love this man. Okay, just to remind us what it's about. And when Jesus tells us this in these moments, to remind us, this is what this is. And just a few minutes after he leaves that communion table, he shows us exactly how much he loves this church. He's arrested, he's put on a mock trial, he is crucified. He dies for each and every one of us. He dies for you. He dies for me. He dies for each couple that I work with. He dies for each couple that just sort of imagines that the wedding is all it takes. It's all we need. We just need to uh, have this big party. It's all going to be fixed. He dies for the couple that also, there is a lot that assume that it's, I'm, I'm broken. And one of the things that, that people do is it's not just a party. And I got, I, I got a lot of that. There's some folks that just want to do that. But what's really deep down inside for most couples is there is a belief, if you really get down to it, they think, they believe, they hope that this day will fix all of it. It will fix all of it. What is all of it? Well, it'll fix my past. It'll fix my mistakes. It'll fix my broken first marriage. It'll fix the family that I grew up in. It'll fix it all. This one day, this is what 
I'm looking for. I'm looking for this one event to fix all the things that are broken in my life. And I don't try to poo-poo it. I don't try to say, well, no, 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 it's not about that. I say, I know why, I know why you have that. I know why you have that. Because you want things to be fixed. You want them to be fixed. And the reality is whether you go to a wedding this coming Saturday or whether you approach this table, there really, really is something inside all of us that we do want it to be fixed. And that is the beauty of what happens when we approach Christ, when we accept his love, when we approach this table, there is someone who can fix it. It's not a minister, it's not a DJ at a wedding, it's not anything like that. The one who can fix you is actually here. What you're looking for, what people are looking for in these events, what people are looking for in this process, they're looking for the second chance, they're looking for forgiveness, they're looking for another option, and today we have. And so as you approach this table this morning, may you be in a place where you recognize, I am wanting to be fixed, and I want to meet the one who actually can. Let's pray. God, we thank you. And we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to be in a relationship with you. God, that... I, I know that not everybody is excited about weddings the way I am. But I know what, I know what those events mean. And I know what people are looking for. Whether they're 25, 45, 65, or 85. We want something to happen in our lives that takes care of it, that fixes it, that puts it all back together again. May this be a moment for each of us that we can truly see you doing that. And I'll just bring your name.